to the third presentation for this exhibit. Um, I see a lot of people who were at all three, and I really want to thank you for that. Um, the uh, initial presentation was by Caitlin McCurk from the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library. Uh, she's here tonight. Thanks a lot, Caitlin. Um, and the second one, and that was about the past of Ohio Comics. And then the second one was with a panel discussion with Victor Dandridge and, and, and several other people. And that was about the present and how the face of the creators in Columbus may not be the people you expect them to be. Um, and if you see the trend on where I'm going, tonight's presentation is about the, uh, the future of comics. Not that, uh, <laughs> not that this old crap here is necessarily the future of the year. I'm the future of comics. The, the future of comics only in the sense that your book, My Friend Dahmer, used techniques which are kind of new to, to, to creating a, uh, an extended narrative. A lot of people are familiar with editorial cartoons and, and that kind of journalism as applied to cartoons, but not to a longer form. Um, and it's just to show a slice of what's actually possible and what can be achieved if people take different areas of, uh, of expertise and money to, to the creation of graphic novels and comics. So we'll, we'll get going on that. A couple of plugs beforehand. Uh, I'd like to thank the Ohio Art League for giving me the opportunity to, to have this exhibit up this month. Um, it's been a fantastic experience. Um, I hope that all of you will consider getting Art League memberships. Um, they, they come in student artists, and I, I believe they have just art supporter or, or, or some such. Uh, I know the student rate's as low as 25. My membership was only 50 bucks. Um, and it's already, in my mind, it's already paid for itself in the first year out, so definitely worth checking into. Um, second thing is, uh, there is a pop-up shop back there with local comics. I hope everybody will take a chance and, and, and buy something from an artist that they don't know, or take a look at all of them. Uh, I told them that maybe people will buy their stuff, so I hope you do. Um, and that's it. So I'll let Durf go on ahead, and I hope everybody enjoys the presentation. Thank you. I like my awesome ham here. That is just that has to be, the, I think, the highlight of my book tour so far. Uh, <laughs> Old people have great equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so, as Ken said, he asked me to talk to you about the journalistic approach to making comments, to making long form comments. You know, when I set out to do this book, I really was not trying to like pioneer some new way of doing comics. I use journalism and a journalistic process to make comics because that's how I was trained um, at the fine institution right across the street. I graduated with a degree in journalism. Um, and in fact, I went, I went there on a scholarship, a journalism scholarship. I actually never, never set foot inside an art class at Ohio State. So I have always told stories this way, using these techniques. Um, and that goes for nonfiction as well as fiction. Uh, I've done three graphic novels so far, and I've used really pretty much the same, to varying degrees. I mean, nothing is as extreme as my friend Donna, which is this you know, very meticulous, meticulously researched nonfiction uh, memoir. And you know, I, Caitlin, uh, you're here. Um, I had a really uh, interesting I was like eavesdropping in a really interesting debate on the library board because uh, I just won some library awards from the ALA, American Library Association, which is great. I love librarians, they, they rule. Um, but there were some people who were, you know, getting into cataloging debates, which probably only interest you. But <laughs> they were debating whether graphic novels could be nonfiction at all. Not just because of the stupid name, graphic novels, and we all, you know, object to that name. Thank you, Will Eisner. Um, I personally prefer the term big ass comic book. <laughs> but because you know you're recreating something, a scene rather than just using photo footage or, or you know documentation, so it can't be nonfiction. I don't know that I agree with that, but anyways. Um, so my friend Dara, which came out about a year ago, is now already in the sport printing. And uh, for those of you who haven't read it, it is the story of my teenage friendship with the strange boy who would grow up to be the most depraved serial killer since Jack the Ripper. And we were friends from seventh grade until we graduated high school, just before he killed his first victim. 
And when I approach this book, um, I myself am not a tremendous fan of, uh, there's my Freud number, by the way. That'll be out in another, another couple of weeks. Um, along with Mona Me Dahmer, which sounds so much classic. <laughs> um, I'm not a huge fan of comics memoir myself. Um, I, I find it, I mean, there's a lot of it out there, a lot of it's really lousy. And I mean, some of it's really good. But, you know, I always question whether a lot of it reads like eight great diary stuff. And, you know, some of it, it's, it's, it just doesn't, I, mean, I wonder how, you know, really true it is. I mean, it's more perception than actual nonfiction. When I approach this, I mean, this project had to be memoir because, you know, I'm a part of it. There's no choice. I mean, I'm a character in this tale, so it had to do with this way. But I was never comfortable with just doing it as straight memoir. So I made it more than memoir. Um, I also made it less than memoir. I made it more by expanding this and, and really uh, casting a wide net as far as research goes and pulling in a lot of different things that have been written and um, uh, using a lot of investigative techniques to really flesh out this story. I probably shouldn't use that phrase. <laughs> um, it's less than memoir because I'm not the central figure of this book like most memoir. And if I had made myself a central figure, it would have been a very different book entirely. So I want to talk real, you know, I try not to get too wonky journalistic about this, but talk about the various uh, ways I put this book together. And the most important thing when you approach a story like this is sources. And the standard that I was taught, the baseline I was taught at journalism school was, you know, you never go with one source. So a lot of comics, you know, that have been done in the past, they're written off a book, they're written off a news account, it's just one source, they do, the, they do the comic and they go. My baseline was three sources for everything. Now one of those sources could be me, because you know, it's after all my personal recollections and my own papers. I mean, that was okay. But I always looked for corroboration in other, other ways. And when the story started, the first thing I had to do was get the facts right. Because when you do nonfiction, man, if you screw it up, if you make a mistake, it casts the entire project into, you know, uh, into question. And you will be called out on it. I mean, there's no question. So you have to get the facts right. Now, I usually start with news accounts. And newspapers are the go-to source because they, not because they're surviving, and indeed they are not, and they'll soon be gone. But even now, and certainly in 1991, when this story first broke all those years ago, newspapers were still primary news gathering operation in existence because they have the resources. They can devote multiple reporters, photographers, editors, everything they have. They have archives. And when I look at a story um, like this, and really any breaking news story, even as a news consumer, I go to the largest local paper near the event, like the, the Newtown thing. It was the New York Times, because Newtown's basically a bedroom community. Because they know the lay of the land right there and they can devote the maximum resources to it. I don't trust TV. <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, blogs, they always write off the news. TV always writes off the news. They're just ripping off newspapers. When newspapers find, TV usually re-reports. It's a technique called rip and read. They report it the same day as if they concocted it when in fact they, you know, if it's not a blizzard or a house fire, they're capable of covering it. So I always go to the main news source. And in, uh, in the case of the Dahmer thing, it was the Akron Beacon Journal, which was the nearest big paper to my hometown of Bath. Bath was actually a suburb. And the Beacon at that time was actually the best paper in the state, believe it or not. It won a Pulitzer every five years. In fact, my wife won one to the Beacon. And uh, it was really just the kick-ass paper in, in, in the state. Um, it also happened that I was part of this coverage. I got pulled into it. I didn't talk to a lot of people, but I did talk to the Beacon. Um, because my wife was working there, and I had an on and off relationship with her. So I was a primary source for their coverage. And this gave me a great advantage because, and this is only, you know, this only applies, this part only applies to this particular story. And I'm, you know, I struggle with how to give this lecture because, you know, so much of it is unique to this story, but we'll see if we can pull something out of it anyways. Um, so I had this access, and I mean, I was like sitting right next to the reporters as all this material came in that they got like police reports and uh, uh, 
confessions and evidence reports and all this stuff that they had the legal muscle to get their hands on, or if I had requested it, you know, they would have gone, yeah, right, get out of here. But it was right there. And even this early on, I, I knew that I wanted to do something with this story. So I was like, you know, kind of secretly making notes of all the evidence that they had and making copies on the office copier and just saving it for my own material. So I slowly built this, this uh, archive of news accounts. And the way news breaks, you have to be, you have to be aware of it. You know, news is not, if you're going to go back and do a nonfiction book based on an old news account, you just can't take the day or the second day after an event happens. News breaks over a period of time, like the Newtown thing. I mean, it was days and days and days before we got more details about what was happening because the cops weren't talking. So you really have to look over a large period of time, maybe two or three weeks, maybe months, before you can pull the facts out of news accounts. Um, I also got to go to the, the crime scene. I went there with a cops reporter, and uh, I mean, there were the media just lined up and down this, this country road in front of Dahmer's boyhood home where he killed his first victim probably like three miles in every direction. And you know, they lifted the police tape and we got in because the cop reporter had contacts within the police department. And all the, I could hear the other reporters yelling behind us when we got in. And uh, so I got to actually kind of walk around the crime scene, which was pretty spooky. This is actually the crawl space underneath his uh, back porch where he chopped up his first victim. And uh, I mean, the body was long gone. I mean, Dahmer basically turned his kid to powder. But, you know, when they went in here, they went in this, you can see it's not a big space. You know, they, they spray that stuff to find dry blood, and some kind of light that makes it glow. When they did that, the whole thing lit up. Floor, ceilings, walls. It's a spooky, spooky room. So I, you know, had, this is a primary source. It gave me like a, a structure, a factual structure to build the rest of the story. From there, using my own training, I knew that you know I had to report this story myself. So I went out and started interviewing people. Just over the course of a couple years, mostly uh, my friends, classmates, neighbors, teachers, uh, that sort of thing. I would just, uh, and this is how I do notes. I mean, obviously we're all you know visual word people here, so I mean naturally my notes take that kind of form too. Just filling. I mean, I have a sketchbook, probably this this thick, full of notes. And a lot of it is stuff I'll never use, and indeed did not use. But there was some really good stuff that I had covered here. My, my point is here is that don't be, don't be satisfied with the reporting that others have done. It's not that hard to go out and interview people and talk to people. You don't want to be confrontational. You want to be conversational. You know? I mean, a lot of people I interviewed didn't even know they were being interviewed. You just kind of casually. Now, I again had an advantage here that you would not, depending on the project you were taking. But I was a local kid, a lot of people knew me, so you know, I had that in. And it just built from there. Um, this was my, so this would be my second source, notes, interviews. And very quickly I zeroed in on a couple of my buddies who I would go back to again and again and again as sources. And over the course of building this tale, you know, my own, my own memories, I would corroborate with them. And if I, I thought if I had three guys remembering something the same way. It was a, there was a pretty good chance that that was how it went down. It's, uh, and this is my, kind of my problem with memoir. Um, I was in a memoir panel at one of the festivals last year. I, I won't name names, but a couple of the big memoir comics people were on there. And don't get me wrong, they're great. Um, this is not meant as a criticism. But one of them was commenting about how, you know, he was really, he was really curious that, that he'll write a story about a certain event, and they'll show it to the other people who are involved in the event, and they'll say, wow, man, I don't remember it like that at all. And, and he kept, he, he brought this up, you know, it's kind of a demonstration about how memory is, is funny, and I, I just looked at him and said, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. I mean, if you're remembering it dramatically different than someone who's standing right next to you, that's a matter of perception. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not observing what's happening with kind of a, a clear eye. You're already coloring it some way. You know, there, some of these guys, their work tends to be very poetic. It tends to be, you know, spin off into different directions. I mean, you think of like Julie Duchet, who did memoir, and 
you know, pretty soon she was a 50-foot menstruating giant rampaging through the streets. You know, it's, this is not the type of thing that I was interested in, but what I was really happy with is that my memories lined up very closely to the other guys who were relying on. And when you interview people, you never ask leading questions. That's the other important thing. You don't say, you know, hey, remember the time you, me, and Donner went to the 7-Eleven and you started spazzing out in the candy aisle and the woman freaked out. And wasn't that, what do you think about that? And that's not how you answer it. You know, you ask that question. You ask, remember that time you and me and Donner went to the 7-Eleven? Do you remember what happened? And you leave it open so their memories are coming in unprompted. It's just an interview, you know, that kind of interviewing technique. This isn't hard stuff to learn. It's stuff I learned at the J School across the street, but it comes in handy. Did I flip by stuff? The other thing, so I have news accounts. I have my own interviews reporting. The next step is getting documents. And documents are not really hard to do, um, depending on who you're asking. Um, I get a lot of police reports. Um, I got some of the confessions, that sort of thing. That was not really that all that informative. What I found really informative were transcripts of interviews that Dahmer gave in prison. And he gave dozens of these things. There's hundreds of pages, mostly to the FBI, FBI profiler psychologists. And these are just gold because at this point he's long dead. The only way to interview him is through these transcripts. What I liked about it is it's raw data. It's not edited by anybody. You know, it's just unfiltered. Here's the question, here's the answer. And I really mine these things over and over again. I found a lot of good material in here. Stuff not only that I used, but that lined up with my own memories. And, and uh, my own, and the news accounts as well. A lot of this stuff you can get, I'm only gonna briefly talk about this, you can get uh, through freedom of information requests. This kind of thing only applies to federal agencies passing in the Ford administration after Watergate. They're supposed to give you material that is not classified. And of course, they've been chiseling away at it ever since. And now there's all sorts of uh, mandates put on it. This doesn't apply to state agencies and, or local agencies. Now, states from state to state have their own type of freedom of information. Ohio is something called the Sunshine Law. Um, this is what stuff looks like when you get it. You know, they block out all the classified stuff whatnot. It's funny that it's easier to get stuff out of an agency like the FBI than it is to get something out of a local village or town. I mean, you know, there you run into some old 55-year-old biddy behind the counter who says, no, you can't have it. I don't want you to have it. And that's pretty much a dead end. You're stuck. Unless you have the muscle, the legal muscle of like a newspaper behind you, which, you know, at this point is not. But it's just a curious way it works. So news accounts, my own interviews, um, some documentation, and my fourth major source was my own papers. Um, I was lucky enough, and this only applies to this story, I realize, but I was lucky enough to have high school journals. And I kept a lot of them, just stuff I threw things in, I had boxes full of these things from my high school days, because you know I had to, I had to log down my deep thoughts at age 17. Um, but these things were gold, not because there was a not because they were particularly wise or insightful, but it just gave me a look at what I was thinking and feeling back when I was young. And since I was writing about that, this was just, I mean, it was, it was just wonderful to have. Um, I don't think I would have been able to do this book had I not had these things. Um, I guess it's, you know, it's sort of uh, an example of you should keep a journal if you're a writer. I, I, I guess that's the lesson there. And I'm glad I did. Um, a lot of uh, acclaim that the book has received is about how accurately and uh, detailed I recreate this uh, particular period of time, the late 70s in a small town in Ohio, and all the stuff that came with that. I mean, it's not just about Dahmer if you haven't read the book. And people are really struck by that. And that is a direct result of having this kind of material at my disposal. Um, you know, uh, old scribes, this is Dahmer is a member of Devo that I did in high school. We used to call him Damier. I don't remember why, but we did. I didn't work that into the story because it seemed pretty hard to figure out. But, uh, you know, I had old photos of Dahmer from high school. There he is doing his little uh, shtick in the classroom. I mean, I even, I even give him that jacket in, uh, 
in, uh, in the book. I mean, I really went over the top with the detail. My thinking on detail is, you know, you can't have too much. I mean, the more you add into the story, the more you add into your work, the more texture it will have. And even if it's only on an instinctual level, as people are flipping through, I think they'll respond to it. I believe they do. And my experience with this book is that they do. Um, yeah, Father Don, I have no freaking idea what this is. <laughs> this is another thing from my sketchbook. Um, it was probably just me goofing around at lunch, and Donald was probably sitting right across the table from me when I drew it. Uh, so I have a lot of random stuff like this that I could never use. It's just kind of freaky to have. Another page from my sketchbook. That's my uh, school ID up there, pasted down. Yes, I was bad and emaciated. <laughs> and then, you know, you have to think outside the box a little bit and try to come up with some other sort of material. <clears throat> Um, as I, I was having a lot of trouble nailing down dates, like when things happen, like you know, senior things, senior prom. And all. I mean, all this stuff had been lost. Who had never been archived? At this point, it was you know, 15, 16, maybe even longer years after high school graduation. And as I was sitting around, I thought, man, my mom used to keep these really great day calendars. I wonder if she still has those. And of course, she did. And the woman never throws away anything. They were stacked up in the basement. And I had these calendars, and they were fabulous. I mean, they had times, names, dates, where things were. It really helped me um, put together the timeline of, of when things happened. I'll get to that in a minute. But you also have to be really critical of source material. You can't believe everything. Now, one of the, strangely, one of the worst sources you can use when doing nonfiction is other books, um, particularly crime, true crime. Because after an event, a lot of junk nonfiction comes out, and that was especially true of Donald. There were dozens of these books that came out in a year or two after his crime, just to cash in on it. And they're full of mistakes, and they're full of lifted material. I would look through these things, you know, I got a couple of them, leaf through them. And, you know, you look through, well, that's wrong, and you know, the name of that street is wrong, and the name of that guy is wrong, and oh, here's a quote from me, even though I never talked to this guy. It's, he lifted a quote out of the Akron paper, the one media outlet I talked to, so it was, you know, into the recycle bin. So you can't believe every source. You really have to be, limit them to the ones you trust and, and discount everything else. Um, the other important thing about source material, once you start pulling in source material, you have to organize it. And this is something great I learned in journalism school. You have to organize your, your notes. And all reporters do this, and my technique, I'm a big fan of timelines, especially when you're telling a narrative like this one. Um, it's a chronological narrative. I, I don't vary from it. I do flashbacks or things like that. It's just straight through. So I just start building a timeline. And I, I worked this thing for a couple of years. As material came in, I would add it to the timeline. I'd move it around as I figured out where things went. And it's a very useful way to to build a story. What you don't want to do, the big no-no when you're doing a non-fictional book, is to have an idea of what that book is in your head, a really solid idea, and then go out and research it. Because when you do that, get some mail. Um, when you do that, you're going out and getting research that only supports, even if you're doing it subconsciously, the book that you've already formed in your head, and you discount what doesn't fit in the book. That's not how you do it. You have a vague idea of what you want to do, maybe a concept, then you go out and do your research, and then you write your book based on that research, based on the facts. That's nonfiction. Um, this is my Dahmer file cabinet. Um, every drawer is full of stuff that I did for Dahmer. Of course, we as comics people, as visual creators, you know, the factual stuff, the documentation, the writing is only half the equation. The other half is the visuals. I'm a big believer in uh, photo reference. I don't work directly from photos, like I don't incorporate them into my work, like say uh, Brian Michael Bendis used to do with his stuff when he was still drawing. He would actually kind of collage it in. That was very effective for him, it worked very well, but I, I like to draw stuff by hand. But I do pull out details for, to draw. And I like to work off photos because you just can't, you, know, you just can't conjure some of this stuff up. And again, I wanted to get it right. It was very 
important to me to recreate this world as exactly as I could. And at this point, it's probably, you know, 15 years in the rearview mirror, so it's pretty hard to do. I like to organize my photo references I collected by scene. I know, you know, the major scenes I'm going to need, like Dahmer's house, the local mall, the school, you know, sometimes subdividing the school into various things. So I can build it. I kind of keep a running note of what I'll need. And a lot of times you have to be creative to get this stuff. And um, the important thing, especially when you're doing a period piece, no matter what the period, in this case it was the late 70s, your research, your, your photo reference really has to be period because you can, you can trip up trying to fudge it. You've got to get the right period. Um, I had a lot of trouble. I got this scene in the mall. Paid Dahmer to go put on like a spaz performance. He had this whole spaz act he used to do. We paid him for our own amusement to go to the mall one day and do this performance. We called it Dahmer's Command Performance. And I had a lot of trouble uh, recreating this mall. It was just a little crap old mall on the outskirts of Akron. There wasn't a lot of photos available because why would there be? Who cares? Um, <laughs> So I had to use some uh, some some pretty uh, some gymnastics here to come up with something, and this is the reason why. I mean, now you know we have digital, we have our phones that are running around. We can take 300 photos as we're walking through them all, and they're all great because you know the computer that's running our phone is more powerful than the computer that put Neil Armstrong on the moon. But back in the 70s, this was the technological <laughs> the technology we were dealing with. Classic Instamatic cameras with flash tubes on top. I mean, you tried to take something, like a picture of something as big as a mall, and it would just be black or out of focus. You have to load the film, you have to buy the film, you have to take it to the photo mat, you wait a week, you pick it up, and it'll be crap. I mean, it was impossible. The only way to take big interior spaces would they have a big professional rig, 35 millimeter camera with a big photo, uh, the big flash. And then you'd probably be thrown out by mall security anyway, so. There was very little. Um, I managed to find this one photo of the interior of the Sun Mall from the late 70s. I found this in the uh, Akron Beacon Journal photo board when I was secretly prowling prow prow through it looking for reference for my, my friend Dahmer. And this was enough for me to get started. Because you look at this, I mean, you know, I look at this, at this photo and, and, and I'm thinking about malls today and how different it was then. I mean, you can see how hard everything is, you know, the hard tile floor. And I thought about that and I remembered how the women walking with high heels would be like a thunder, you know. It, it just, everything echoed off the acoustic tile ceiling, all the walls are glass and chrome. It was a very different place than malls now, which are all carpeted, you know, you get big plump chairs everywhere, you get like foliage, you can barely see through. I mean, look at the, look at the furnishings they give you the rest there. It's like a, <laughs> prison slab, you know, a bare board on four metal legs. No comfort for you, and I'll get back to shopping, you know. So this is stuff I was able to pick up. Now, we're talking about period, this is the same mall in the mid-80s. So like six or seven years later, look how different it is. It had already been remodeled. So if I had used this as my reference, it would be totally inaccurate. You really, especially commercial, institutions. Man, they just change all the time. So if you're going to get photo reference, you really got to hit it on the nail on the head. This is the other, the only other photo. I was, this is the newsstand that I used to hang out at all the time, where I bought my Vampirellas and creepy magazines. And this is great. I mean, you know, that the uh, Helvetica type is shaped like a shipping crate. It's, it's, it's like, a, you know, the Naughty Pine, the Burnt Orange. I mean, this is like classic 70s here. I actually cut this scene out of the book. And Dahmer used to like sneak up on me when I was in there and like, come up behind me and bleat like a sheep and scare the crap out of me. Um, I did that a couple times, and, but I wanted to cut that scene out of the book. Anyways. That is all I had. That is all the photo reference I had of this mall. So I had to find another way, except for this. I had this uh, sign, which is just a, a kitschy wonder. And you remember I put that in the, yeah, I put that in starting it off. You couldn't make dream up something like that. I mean, that is just, so if you just get enough, you know, these little things that you can play up in your drawings, it tends to pay off. But I needed to get more. 
So I went to the main library, the Akron Main Library, which is a really good library. We're very blessed in Ohio to have this great library system. And main libraries are a wonder in archive. They have almost everything. And sure enough, I, I somehow they had a floor plan of the Summit Mall when it opened in 1970. And I love floor plans. Floor plans are great. I use them a lot, even if I make them myself, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this one was particularly great because it gave me, not only did it give me the configuration of the mall so I knew how to lay out my scenes, but it gave me all the store names. And the stores had not changed that much by the end of the 70s. By the end of the 80s, of course, they'd all be corporate entities. But still, by the end of the 70s, they were basically the same. So then I went down to the newspaper archive, got some papers from the late 70s, and looked, just looked up ads for all these stores and found the logos and printed out the logos. So I was able to add the logos to the background in the right place. And this just sounds totally obsessive, and I really have no apology for it. Um, <laughs> but this is the length to which I went to to do this crap. Um, and so it's pretty, you know, it, it captures, I think, the place. And, and uh, next, uh, Dahmer's house was another one. Now, this was totally different because I was able to go here. The, now, the house, Dahmer's boyhood home, is actually kind of a character in itself in the book. It has its own distinctive kind of funk to it. Um, and in fact, probably more than some of his family did. Um, now, this is Dahmer's house today, or recently. Um, a buddy of mine owns the house, so I had access to it at this point. And I could wander around the grounds and, and have access to the interior. So I could really just kind of sketch and take reference photos to my heart's content. So the scenes inside Dahmer's house are very, very accurate. Now, they've been remodeled a couple times. And I had to figure out what was new and what was old. And I used my buddies to uh, help me with that. Remember this doorway, or was it in a different place, or what do you remember? And we were able to kind of sort of come to a consensus about what was new and what was old. Um, you know, I did a lot of sketches for my own, my own purposes. The furnishings I had to guess at. I mean, there was no way I was going to get those, but and I made a floor plan um, again. So I was able to figure out. I actually kind of paste off the rooms and actually got the dimensions too. So when I put a figure in there, it would be the right scale. Um, these are, I mean, I just think they're great. For example, this, this scene. You know, Jeff comes in through the kitchen, he walks into the living room, walks by this, this uh, guy with cerebral, cerebral, uh, cerebral palsy, and then down the hall toward his bedroom. You can see from the floor plan, he comes in through the kitchen, walks through the living room, down this hall. I mean, that's how I was able to compose that scene and know what was behind it, because I had a floor plan already made and reference photos to go with it. I even made a floor plan of the neighborhood <laughs> using Google Earth. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's great. And the dot there is Dahmer's house. And because of my knowledge of what was there, and again corroborating this with other people who lived nearby, I knew that like the stuff at the top was new, but the stuff at the bottom was all pretty much as it had been. It was an old neighborhood from the 50s. It hadn't changed that much. I liked that I was able to get you know the tree line because I was, had a couple scenes where I was using the tree line and then in the bordering neighborhood. This is just, I mean, you just keep building it, you know? You can't have too much information. The important thing is you have to know how to use it, you have to organize it in a way that's just not a junk pile in the corner of your studio. And you do it methodically. It's, you know, I'm doing this scene, I need this, I need that. And you just go out and you get it. Um, this is Dahmer's uh, house at night. And what I remembered was, um, you know, you just can't, if you're going to do some live drawings and you're going to do a, a, like a long form narrative, you really have to go at different times of day, different times of night, different seasons, you know, everything has a different feel to it. And what I always remember when I was a kid, and this is kind of pulling from, this is the advantage of memoir in the case of this, is that it was a very different place in the day, you know, growing up in a place like this than it was at night. Because in the daytime, you know, I mean, earlier we had, uh, where were we? You know, it's nice, bright, the sunlight's filtering through the trees. And, but at night, you know, it's like impenetrable. It's this wall of impenetrable black. 
And the back of Dahmer's house is a solid windows, floor to ceiling. And I lived in a similar house, and it always freaked me out at night because he just had this, you know, black mirror. And you never, you always fantasize that there was someone out there watching you, and you know, it was really kind of a creepy thing. Um, I tried to play into that with the night scenes that I put in this book. As the story progresses, I pile of night scenes on the back of the back in this book, which was you know, very manipulative of me, but it kind of mirrored Dahmer's increasing darkness. And everything gets more claustrophobic and more closed in. And that was, you know, kind of a direct uh, result of me thinking about what it was like in this environment and reflecting it in the art I was doing. Um, this is actually, I think, my favorite page from the book. I, re I remember driving these roads at night and how dark it was and the trees kind of loomed overhead. And things were just eerily illuminated by the headlights, you know. And if you came across something like a, a dog or a deer or, God forbid, a person walking in the road, it was like, whoa, what the hell is that? It always startled me. It was kind of really alien. They, they looked weird, illuminated. So I, I, that was what I used to pick up this scene. I really like the way it turned out. Um, that, so that is mining a little bit of personal memory. You know, don't be afraid to do that. I don't, it doesn't apply to every nonfiction book. <laughs> Boy, how he's protesting there. <laughs> um, and you can't just be satisfied with sitting in your studio staring at photos. You know, I mean, the number one rule of journalism is get your ass out there. Put yourself in the scene, walk the scenes. You can't do this for everything, obviously, if you're drawing you know, a graphic novel about the North Pole, obviously you're not gonna go there, but um, you know, Joe Sacco does this as well as anybody. I mean, he goes to the scene, particularly his stuff in Bosnia, which is, I think, a masterpiece. Uh, Safe Area Garazza, I believe it's called. Um, because, you know, he gives you a view of the landscape that you don't get from anything else, you get from news reports. Now, it's not, he's not doing combat reporting. I mean, he's not there as the bullets are flying. He's there afterwards. So he's recreating it, but in a way that no one has really ever done before. And that's the power of comics. I mean, that's the advantage that we have to recreate this stuff in a detailed way, change the angle the way we want it. I mean, there really is no other medium that can do this. And I employed a lot of this in my friend Dahmer. Because you're there, you're in the spot. You know, this is uh, Dahmer's Road, the opening scene. This thing here is the same stretch of road. You're there, and the wind is hitting you, and you, you know, the sun's on your back, and you know what's around you and behind you, and you're just getting the total vibe. And you can pull stuff out of that that you can use in comic scenes. I mean, do not be satisfied with staying in your studio. You've got to get out there and report it on your own. Now, one of the things I had a lot of problems with was recreating classrooms. Um, again, getting back to period. I mean, classrooms are pretty complicated things to draw. I think I needed, I thought I needed some reference. You know, you've got all these kids everywhere, things are piled, stuff's on the wall. It just helps to have some reference. Um, but again, I wanted period stuff. Period, period, period. And I was having trouble finding that. I mean, there's a lot of classroom images on Google Images, but they're all over the board. Even if you climb, type in, you know, classroom 1970s, it's still all over the board. I mean, it's really hard to find stuff. I needed something that had a lot of images consistent. And I'm very proud of my solution, which was uh, I found this old sitcom called Square Pegs. <laughs> Some of you are laughing immediately. You've seen the sitcom. Um, it was filmed in 1980, which is right after my time in high school. That's Sarah Jessica Parker there. She's like 14. <laughs> And uh, it's all set in these classrooms. And the sets are really great. And they're not like really high end and everything's squeaky clean. They're all kind of junky, just like they should be. And they're all period. And I just watched these things on Hulu, which was agony, uh, mostly with the sound off. And just took three shots whenever I found something I wanted. And it gave me what I needed because, you know, I had the positioning of you know, people in these chairs and the crap piled up. And I saw some of the shit on the walls. It was really a great solution to this, what was a frustrating problem at the time. So pulling it all together. So now I had all my visuals, I had all my factual stuff. And a lot of times, 
and you're pulling together a story. Really, it's almost like it, it's, a, it's, it's almost a bit of a detective work. Um, for example, this scene uh, is pretty well known in the Dollar uh, Legend. Uh, he found a dog by dead dog by the side of the road one day and took it into the woods and uh, carved it up uh, to get his rocks off. And then decided, in his words, it would be a fun little prank to display it in the woods along a path that a lot of neighborhood kids use to cut through the woods. So he put the head on a stake, as you can see there, and then nailed the rest of the body to a tree. And sure enough, some kid walking through the woods came across this thing, totally freaked out, ran home screaming. The whole neighborhood was alerted. Um, and it, uh, it tore through the school as uh, you know, gossip. Did you hear about the satanic cult that's sacrificing animals in the <laughs> woods near uh, off Bath Road? And I remember this incident in high school. And later it was, you know, it was one of the things that was reported immediately in the press. So I had that much, but nobody really nailed down when it was. Um, Donald confessed to it. I mean, he's the one who brought it up that he had done it. And in interviews, he talks about it very consistently in several interviews, which is great because um, I think if somebody talks about something in the same way repeatedly, it's probably very likely true because eventually you're going to screw up if you're telling a lie. So that had the ring of truth, and he had no reason to be lying at that point. He was very truthful once he was in prison. Um, but he always referred, he had this annoying habit of always like cutting himself some wiggle room. He would, he would never give an exact year when things happened. He would say, when did this happen? Well, when I was 17 or 18. Well, that's a two-year period. I mean, the entire timeline of my book is six years. So that's a third of the book. You know, I needed to narrow it down. So I had my other research, and I knew that Dahmer was one of the youngest kids in our class. He was born at the end of May. So, okay. So we turned 17 at the end of junior year in May of 1977. And he turned 18 at the end of 78. And we graduated high school in mid-June 78. I knew this happened in high school because I remember it happening in high school. I remember the buzz. And all my friends remembered that too, so I had corroboration there. So that cut it down. It had to happen sometime between May 77 and mid-June 1978. Um, this is a photo of the actual dog head. That's a detail. Here's the larger photo that a neighborhood kid, another neighborhood kid took. Now, as looking at this photo, it's obvious that the leaves are not on the trees. <laughs> it's, they've already fallen. So now I can cut it down even more. I mean, the leaves fall. First of November, and we'll come back until mid-April. So that means it had to have happened sometime between November 1977 and mid-April 1978. So now I'm down to six months. I thought I could cut it even further. I had, believe it or not, compiled charts of weather reports for 1977 and 1978 because they were some of the worst winters on record. And I was working this into the, some of the scenes. Um, in Northeast Ohio, it was unreal. I mean, we still have never equaled that kind of uh, uh, snowstorm, particularly the winter of 78, which was unbelievable. We had something called the Great Blizzard of 78, which was basically a white hurricane over Lake Erie that just stalled and kept recharging and dumping more snow. We had 10 to 12 foot drifts in our town. We were out of school for two weeks. It was basically snowbound from the second week of November to March. So I thought, there's no way kids are screwing around in the woods and you know, walking through the woods or playing with dead animals and with 12 foot drifts. I mean, it just wasn't gonna happen. So there was a chance it could have happened, you know, like, you know, between blizzards at one point, but I thought, eh, it's pretty cold. It was bitterly cold that winter. It was like, you know, in single digits for much of the time. Not until March did it start to thaw, so I thought it's got to be sometime in March. It's got to be sometime in March. March 
from like March uh, 1st to April 15th when the leaves came back out. That's as close as I could get. And in the end, I just cut the difference and put it in the end of March. And I thought, you know, that's as close as I can get it. I'll confess that in the footnotes at the end of the book so, you know, people know that this is how I reached this conclusion and why I reached that conclusion. Now, when the book was published, um, which has happened a couple times, a kid in the early scene emailed me. He'd read the book. And uh, he said, you know, I've never talked about this to anybody. Um, but I'm the kid in the book. Describe the scene. I was like, oh, damn, where were you? You know, two years ago when I needed you. But um, he said I got it pretty. I got it pretty accurately. And he described about being freaked out, not so much about the dog head, but about the carcass nailed to the tree. That's what really freaked him out. And some other details. And I wrote him back and said, When did it happen? Do you remember what time of year it was? And he said, I remember it was March. <laughs> <laughs> Touchdown dance around the studio. So, you know, it paid off. I mean, that's the kind of, sometimes the kind of detective work you have to do. It's fun. I mean, you know, if you just use a little logic and use the material you have at hand, even if it's sparse, you can, you can come to the correct conclusion, or not. Um, for example, the cautionary tale, uh, this scene is one I deleted from the book. Um, <coughs> When you're done, I mean, I got to my first draft, and the other big journalistic principle, of course, is fact checking. Even before it went into the copy editing phase, I went through everything and double checked every scene in the book against the material that I had, really taking it down and not trusting anything. Except I kind of slipped up on this scene. Um, this never got to inking, it was still in pencil form. I inked it later to include it as part of the ebook because it's a really cool scene. Uh, Dahmer snuck into a local cemetery, um, went to the grave of a kid who had been, a classmate of ours, a schoolmate of ours, who had been killed in a car wreck the previous summer, he was killed in July, and tried to dig up his body to use as a uh, you know, corpse love slave, I guess. <clears throat> but ground was really hard and probably semi-frozen. And he couldn't make a dent in it. You know, he couldn't get anywhere. I mean, it was, too, it was ridiculous anyways. He never would have been able to get down six feet to pull a whole coffin out. But, you know, it wasn't any straight by this point. Um, and fearing that he would be caught, he gave up and fled. Now, I drew this up and I was really happy with it because it, you know, it's another, yet another atrocity his inexorable march toward the edge of the abyss or becoming a sealer report. But when I got to it, you know, I thought, you know, I really haven't done enough research on this. Originally, I had it set at Bass Cemetery, which is uh, a big cemetery in our hometown. Not that big, but the biggest. And it's right down the street from Dahmer's home, like maybe a mile away. So I figured, you know, just, you know, not even thinking about it, I just drew that in, penciled that in as the cemetery. I thought, I better check that. So I called up the sexton at the township hall and said, you know, I'm looking for a buddy of mine, a club guy I went to school with, and gave him her name. She looked him right up. He said, oh, well, he's not in Bass Cemetery. He's in Iris Cemetery, which is this little tiny cemetery in Coyote Valley down on the edge of town. And I thought, wow, that's even better. It's a really spooky little cemetery at night. Um, it's in the valley near the river, so you get fog, you get these skeletal trees. There's no people around, no light at all. I thought it would make a great scene. And, you know, it does. I mean, it's, it, I was really happy with the way it came together. So I penciled that up. Um, I didn't even really need to go there because I knew it so well. It's near my folks' house, so I drive by it all the time. I just drew it. I figured I could add some details later. Um, <clears throat> and then I went back to fact check a second time. And I got to the scene, and I go, you know, I haven't done nearly enough. So I got in my car, and next time I was down there, and I stopped by the cemetery. And went to look for the guy's grave just to see, you know, when, when exactly the dates were. Found the grave, it wasn't that hard, there were maybe 50 tombstones in the cemetery. There in the headstone, son of a bitch. The guy died in July 1978, not July 1977. So in July 1978, 
We graduated in June 1978, which is also when Dahmer killed his first victim. So when this guy died, and six months later when Dahmer tried to dig him up, he had already killed. He had already killed somebody, he had already had sex with their corpse, he had already butchered them. He was already a monster. So this thing fell completely out of the timeline. What I remember, the strong memories I had, of first the kid being killed, and then the grave being messed with, because that tore through the school too. Well, I thought it did, but actually it tore through my circle of friends. Um, I misremembered. I mean, the, the memories of the shock at both events is very strong, but not the details. And I really had fucked it up. And so I had to cut the scene completely because it fell out of my timeline. And luckily I had another scene that works. I had them back to back, and the other scene works just as well. But I was kicking myself because I had penciled it in and gotten this far. But, you know, in journalism they say it only counts as a mistake when it gets into print. So no harm, no foul. But it is a cautionary demonstration. You've got to, you've got to fact check. I fact checked everything in the book three times. I threw it three times. And this was before I had even got to the copy yet. Coming from any comics, you know, most of us don't know anything about <laughs> copy editing. But this time I was with a major publisher, and they actually hired a copy editor who ruled. I mean, this guy was amazing. There was one scene in the book where I had a, a football game, a Browns game, playing in the background on TV. Just, you know, some random monkey games, and, you know, Pruitt scores a touchdown. I just pulled out random names. This guy, you think I'm in? This guy went back and looked at game scores from that year and checked who scored touchdowns and wrote back and said, well, he couldn't have scored a touchdown because he didn't score a touchdown that month. And I had to change it to reflect the game store <laughs> a, a score from the same month. And I, I, I wanted to give this guy a big kiss because that <laughs> slipped right by me. Um, so you can't fact check non-fiction enough. Uh, whoops. Um, you know, I think that people talk about this book as being kind of some sort of standard bearer about nonfiction comics now. And, you know, it wasn't my intent. I'm happy that people are, are saying that. But I think that the, the field here is wide open. I don't know that I'll ever do another book like this. Um, I've used these same techniques to build other books. Like my last book, Punk Rock and Trailer Parks, which is complete fiction is nonetheless set in a real place, this punk club in Akron called uh, The Bank, which is long gone. And I use these same techniques to recreate that punk club. Interviewing people who knew a lot about it, people who played there, people who, uh, um, did your band play there? Never got there. Never got there? Too bad. Um, people who hung out there, people who worked there. I had some guy make a floor plan for me. I got the photo, stole the photos from the Beacon Journal that existed on this place, and I used the same techniques to create it. Even though it's total fiction, I mean, you can use this stuff to uh, really flesh out your work and, and make it significant. It, as far as nonfiction, there's really not a lot of it out there. You know, there's a lot of memoir. There's a lot of what I call fiction, fictional nonfiction. You know, stuff like. Uh, Alan Moore's from Hell. You know, it's based on real. It's based on a real guy, Jack the Ripper. It's totally made up. None of it's true. A 700-page book that is basically just fiction. Um, I actually don't like that that much. I mean, that one's really well done. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I think the truth has become such a, a fuzzy thing anymore. You know, it's just what is truth anymore? I think as storytellers, um, I think there should be a lot more stuff based on truth, yeah, because it's important that, that the truth get out there. And there are a lot of people walking around that think they know the Jack the Ripper story because they read Alan Moore's book. Well, guess what? They don't. And um, there's a lot of potential for stories out there. And I think that you know there's so much repetition in comics. I mean, do we really need another memoir comic? Do we really need another superhero comic? Do we need another dragon comic? You know, There's a lot of stories out there to be told. And It's a lot of work. I mean, this book, you know, in total, took me 20 years to pull together, but that's nuts, and that's not what it should have taken. But it took me a good, a 
good five years, once I really dug into it and started pulling and doing research again, it took a good five years. Um, it shouldn't have taken that long either, but you know, I was doing other stuff too, so. Um, so I'd like to leave you with, uh, with this. Did I ever tell you guys how I designed Brutus Buckeye? Whenever I come back to Ohio State, I feel I should, I should bitch about this. Uh, this was Brutus Buckeye when I went to school here. He was just this big paper machine gun that only the legs stuck out of the bottom. It was so heavy, the poor slob had to wear a shoulder pad. And all he could do was move the eyebrows. So he just used to stagger around the sidelines like a giant cow turd. The worst, the worst mascot in major college sports. So I'm here. I'm working for the Lantern. Um, and the vice president in charge of marketing and mascot, whatever, decided, announced that he was going to, they were going to redesign Brutus Buckeye to make it more interactive with, you know, the cheerleaders and be able to do stunts and stuff. But they didn't have any, anything beyond that. They hadn't started the process yet. So they write, we'll write the story about it, and the editor said, draw off a sketch of Brutus Buckeye, what he's supposed to look like. So that's my Brutus Buckeye. <laughs> And that's what resulted. <laughs> Look familiar? <laughs> now, how many millions has this guy made in the sale? You know what I get paid for that? <laughs> Ten bucks. <laughs> uh, I want my royalties. <laughs> this is like a Jack Kirby case of you know, being ripped off. So, if anybody has any questions, I think we got we got time for a few. Okay. You mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. Well, do you have any copies of uh... my friend Dahmer? Yeah. I don't think I do. I mean, no, I'm, I'm actually not contractually allowed to sell them myself. <laughs> like out of the trunk of my car, like that sign does. Uh, I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but uh, it's available all over. Um, you know, I, I think it's like 12 bucks on Amazon right now. Though I prefer you buy it from a local bookstore. Right. My friend um, Dahmer is the I just got water. Yeah, yeah. And the digital one is. Pretty sweet too. It's got a lot of extra material, like from Comicsology. You can get it on iTunes too. I think it's like ten bucks. Yeah, you mentioned earlier at the beginning you were talking about how newspapers are going away. Mm -hmm. How do you think that's going to affect journalism overall? But and then specifically, sort of, and you mentioned now seems like a good time for comics journalism, journalism comics to kind of rise. But at the same time, there's this you know, bet. Journalism that's fading. So, I mean, how, how do you right. know it's all going to work? Well, what we're really losing is the news gathering apparatus. That's what we're miss. That's what we're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And some of it will survive. You know, the New York Times will survive, and a couple other big papers, Wall Street Journal. Um, yeah, we're going to really. It's going to. It's not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I think in five years they'll all be gone, and um, you know we'll be the lesser for it as a free society. Absolutely. I mean, blogs. You know, they have their function, but I mean, most blogs, most uh, TV operations, they, they write off newspapers. And when that news gathering apparatus is gone, it's going to be tough. I think that, uh, I mean, it's tough enough as it is. The government gets away with a lot of things it does. It's, it, yeah, it's not going to be pretty. It's a real challenge. It seems like it would be harder and harder to do the kind of journalism that you did to get this work together. Well, yeah, if you're doing some current, yeah, you're going to have to do a lot of the reporting yourself. So that's you know some of the techniques I was talking about. Um, if you're doing period stuff, I mean it's all archived. So a lot of libraries are strangely trying to get rid of their newspaper archives. What's that about? Or, um, the Cleveland Public Library wants to get rid of their entire newspaper archive. They want to pawn it off on somebody else. Um, and they have an awesome newspaper archive, which I used uh, in the course of uh, researching this book. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer for you. I'm, I'm as concerned about it as you, probably more, since I've devoted so much of my life to newspapers. So it's, not, it's not pretty. It's not a good thing. So you did a, a short 25 page or something of this story originally? Oh, I had a couple, uh, yeah, I had a couple incarnations. I started, you know, I just didn't figure, know what I was going to do with it. So I did some short stories. I put out a self published thing and think, try to. Um, sell a larger project to a publisher, couldn't do it. I had a 100 page graphic novel that I tried to sell, couldn't do that. And finally this last incarnation, this is why it took 20 years. <laughs> finally this last one was, was, was bought and I really made it. It's a big work. And you know, now it's about
that's all. So to all those people who turned it down, <laughs> I'm getting a lot of pleasure out of doing that. <laughs> Yes. What about other, uh, I know with my comics I draw on a lot of my previous business experiences. I know a lot of uh, other people draw on their other on their background to, to, to do the writing. How would you recommend, <clears throat> obviously you had a journalistic background so that's how you started doing comics. What would you recommend to people who are, are trying to draw on their own experience? Well I think that's perfectly valid and I've often drawn on my, I mean all my books are to some extent drawn on personal experience. Um, you know, you write what you know, and when you write what you know, it gives your work an element of truth that I think readers respond to. And you can't just be satisfied with personal experience. You have to sort of broaden it and try to add um, some kind of factual spine to whatever you're doing. But specifically, it's nonfiction. If it's fiction, that's something completely different. But nonfiction, if it's, you know, that sort of wanders into the realm of memoir, and then, you know, there are a lot of minefields there. And we've seen a lot of that, you know, a lot of memoir books have just blown up over the last couple of years. They've been exposed, it's completely fabricated or, or uh, you know, at least enhanced. And that's the danger of memoir. You know, I don't trust a lot of memoir. I mean, there's been too many examples of people making crap up. So I want to see, what I'd like to see is more footnote. I would like to see source material. Um, I mean, Spiegelman just did that after the fact with the Meta Mouse which is an entire book put out that is basically all the source material he used to do mouse. Why he didn't include it with mouse is kind of a mystery. But Did yeah. you ask with your publisher that that happened? No, no, they love the footnotes. And most of the people that like the book really are, are always complimenting the footnotes, which makes me feel good. Now, doing footnotes, as I said, there's 20 pages in the back. I mean, those took shape at the same time that was, the book took shape. I was doing them both concurrently. I didn't wait until I was done with the book and then try to footnote everything. I was keeping track as I was writing scenes where my source material came from, so I wouldn't lose track of it. But um, I, th I think footnotes are great. I love footnotes. Uh, maybe because I'm a you know, journalism monk, but I mean, I, I think a lot of people do. It was especially important for this book because as you read it, and I've heard this from a lot of people, you know, you get to certain scenes like Dahmer alone by himself somewhere, and you think, oh, how the hell is he? He just must be making this up. And then you get to the end of the book, and by God, there's a footnote. You know, this scene on page 12, panel three through five. Here's the interview where Dahmer talks about this, and here's the corroborating uh, police report that says this is what happened. I mean, and that's so. I mean, it really at the end, it really drove it home. This was true. This was, you know, this was not made up crap. And I think that's really important for anyone.